This is chapter three of Matter and Energy, section two, states and properties of matter. Now we've all learned from a very young age that matter comes in a few different physical states, solid, liquid, and gas, right? We may know that there are some more exotic states out there as well, but for the most part, everything that you see around you is gonna be in one of those three states, solid, liquid, or gas. So the purpose of these slides is gonna to be to um, sort of clarify the distinction between these states and put it on a little bit more firm theoretical foundation. Okay? So we'll start with solids. Solids we know have a definite volume and they also have a definite shape. Okay? You can change the shape by cutting them or breaking them or pounding them, but as long as they're just uh, sitting on their own, they have a definite fixed shape. And this is because the particles in a solid are very close together and they're also in a fixed arrangement, okay? They move or vibrate a little bit around their fixed positions, but relative to one another, they do not move uh, at all, really. So the particles, since they're not moving very much, that means they, they don't have very much energy. Uh, amethyst, you can see here, is an example of a solid. It's a solid made from silicon atoms and oxygen atoms, and there's some other atoms in there that give it its particular color. Um, but the silicon and oxygen atoms are fixed in their positions relative to one another. Liquids, on the other hand, uh, they do have a definite volume, but their shape is indefinite. They can adapt or take the shape of whatever container you put them in. And this is because even though the particles are very close together, the way that they are in solids, they're mobile. They can move past one another and they are not locked into a fixed position relative to one another. So the particles move slowly, okay? And they can maybe move, you know, if you have a molecule of water on one side of the, this glass, then it'll move over time and randomly go throughout the whole volume of the water eventually if you give it enough time, okay? So this is what makes it a liquid. The particles are still packed close together, but they're mobile. They move past one another easily. And then finally, we have gases, which don't have a definite shape or a definite volume. And this is because the particles have so much energy and are moving so fast that they basically completely ignore one another. Um, they're very far apart. They don't really interact with each other at all, except to a very minor extent, which we neglect in most cases. And so they can expand to fill the volume of whatever container you put them in, and also, of course, the shape of that container as well. Here we see a chart that just summarizes some of these properties of solids, liquids, and gases. We have the shape, the volume, uh, the arrangements of the particles, whether they're fixed and close together or close together and mobile or uh, very far apart and moving very quickly. And then their interactions, the movements, and some examples. So from these definitions of the different states of matter, we can take these uh, descriptions of different substances and determine whether they apply to a solid, a liquid, or a gas, very simply, right? So if something has a definite volume, it takes the shape of its container, well, the definite volume means that it's either a solid or a liquid, um, but we know that if it takes the shape of its container, it can't be a solid, because solids have a fixed shape, so it must be a liquid. For B, it says its particles are moving rapidly. And that is most characteristic of a gas. The more energy that the particles have, the more uh, fast they move, the further apart they'll go and they'll become like a gas. C says its particles fill the entire volume of a container. And that is also characteristic of a gas. Okay, If the particles have enough energy that they fly apart from one another and they're not stuck together, then they're going to bounce all over the container and they will fill, to, uh, they'll fill the entire volume. D says its particles have a fixed arrangement, and this is uh, descriptive of a solid. This is the characteristic of a solid. E says its particles are close together, but moving randomly, and that is obviously a liquid. Close together means solid or liquid, uh, but they're moving randomly relative to one another, so they're not in a fixed position, and therefore it's not a solid. It must be a liquid. Here we see the answers. Physical properties of matter include any characteristics that can be observed or measured without changing the identity or the composition of the substance. Okay? So we can look at an object and discern its shape, its physical state in the sense of whether it's a solid, liquid, or a gas, um, and we can see its color. Right? And then there are other properties which take a little bit more 
uh, investigation, but still we don't need to change them. So we can boil or freeze something to determine its boiling or freezing point without chemically changing it, right? If you take ice, for instance, which is solid water, and you heat it up, you'll be able to determine the temperature at which it melts into liquid water. But the molecules in the ice are the same molecules that are in the water. We've just given them enough energy so that they can separate a little bit and start to move relative to one another. And density is a similar uh, property like this. We learned in previous chapters that to get the density, you just need to measure the mass and the volume, and then you can calculate the density. So we can do all of these things and determine all of these properties without changing the substance itself or changing the composition or causing it to undergo any sort of chemical reaction. As an example, here we have copper. And the physical properties of copper include its color, which is a distinct reddish-orange color. Uh, the fact that it's shiny, it reflects light in a certain way due to the electrons in the copper atoms. Uh, for similar reasons, it conducts electricity and heat very well. Uh, it's solid at 25 degrees Celsius. That's a, about room temperature. And in fact, it has a very high melting point. You'd have to heat it to over 1,000 degrees Celsius to melt it, and then over 2,500 degrees Celsius in order to boil it. Okay. So these are all physical properties of the copper. A physical change occurs in a substance if one of these physical properties changes, but only the physical properties change. That means that there can't be any change in the identity or the composition of the substance. So we can cut something or we can mold something or we can even melt or evaporate something and that'll change the physical properties, but it won't change the chemical properties. And so those are all physical changes. So these are examples of some changes a system or an object or a substance might undergo. And uh, this is asking us to state whether this change is a change of state or a change of shape. So first, chopping a log into kindling. Well, chopping a log into kindling is just breaking it up into uh, different shapes, right? It's not melting the log or freezing the log or anything like that. So this is a change of shape. The next one is water boiling in a pot. Water going from the liquid to the vapor state to the steam state is a change of state. That's called evaporation or boiling. Ice cream melting is also a change of state. This is a solid melting into a liquid. Ice forming in a freezer is the opposite. That is also a change of state, but it's going from uh, a liquid and freezing into a solid. And then the final one, E, is cutting dough into strips. And clearly that is a change in shape, not a change of state. So in contrast with physical properties, substances also have chemical properties. The chemical properties describe how the substance can turn into a new substance. In other words, the ways in which its composition can change or the ways in which it can react with other substances or maybe with energy. So when a chemical change takes place, the original substance is turned into a new substance that has new chemical properties because it has a new structure, a new composition. Um, and also it'll usually have new physical properties. Okay. This isn't always the case. It's possible that two distinct substances have similar physical properties. At least some of the physical properties might be the same. Um, but usually, in most cases, the physical properties will change as well. And oftentimes in chemistry, we look to observe changes in the physical properties to provide evidence or an indication that there's been a chemical change. So this is one example of that. Uh, this is showing a picture of iron nails on the, the left side of the picture, which are bright and new, right? They just look like shiny silver, well, not silver, but they're uh, silver-colored iron nails. And then on the right side of this pile of nails, you see a bunch of nails that have been rusted. So this rusting is a process called oxidation, and it is a chemical change. But one of the ways that you can see that the chemical change has occurred is by observing a change in the physical properties, right? The nails go from being shiny and smooth to being dull and red and, and rough. And this also changes their conductivity, for example. The, the uh, new nails, the iron nails, will conduct electricity, but the rusted nails will not conduct electricity as well. So those are physical properties that have changed, but they've changed because of a change in the underlying chemical properties, okay? And so if we were to investigate the chemical properties of the two types, the iron and the iron oxide, we would see that those are also different. 
Here you have a table just summarizes some of what we talked about, including examples of physical changes and examples of chemical changes. This is a summary of the, the definitions, really, of physical properties, chemical properties, and physical changes and chemical changes. So here are uh, several pro different processes that, again, a substance might undergo. And now, instead of asking whether it's changing shape or changing state, they want to know whether this is describing a physical change or chemical change. So the first one, A, is ice melting in the sun. So you have ice, which is solid water, right? Water in the solid state, and it is melting into a liquid. This is an example of a physical change. The water molecules that make up the ice are exactly the same as the water molecules that make up the liquid water that they melt into. There's no chemical difference between the two. It's just a difference in how they're arranged. B is a candle burning. And when a candle burns, this is an example of what's called combustion. Combustion is a chemical change, right? And you can tell that it's a chemical change, not only because you see the, the flame, right? The flame represents the release of heat and energy in the form of light, um, but also because the wax in the candle disappears during the course of it burning, right? It doesn't just melt into a pool of liquid wax at the bottom, although some of the wax will melt and, and pool at the bottom, but most of the wax actually combusts and it gets converted into other substances through burning, right? The wax is actually the fuel for that combustion process. And so the wax will turn into CO2 and H2O and be released into the atmosphere. So that is a chemical change. C, it says the tarnishing of a silver knife. This is also a chemical change. The silver, uh, when it's exposed to the atmosphere, will react, the silver atoms react with trace amounts of sulfur in the atmosphere and form a new compound called silver sulfide, which is, a, a, again, a dull, gritty, black coating on the surface of the silver. It's just, this is a similar process to iron rusting, but this is what happens between silver and sulfur instead. So that's a chemical change. D says cutting a pizza. Clearly, just cutting a pizza, if it's already been cooked, just cutting it is really just a change in the shape, and so that's a physical change. E is toasting a marshmallow. Toasting a marshmallow is a chemical change, okay? Because when you toast a marshmallow, you're not just heating it up and melting it, right? It may go through that process some point along the way where the, the sugar in the marshmallow just begins to melt and liquefy, but if you've actually toasted it to the point where it turns brown or black, that is indica indicative of a chemical change, right? So any sort of cooking, well, I should say most, most types of cooking involve uh, a chemical change through heat. So if you took a piece of bread, for example, and you just warm it up, well, that's a physical change. At the end, you just have warm bread, right? But if you take a piece of bread and you put it in the toaster and you come back later and you take out a piece of toast that has that brown coating on the surface of it, you've then performed a chemical change. You've actually turned the bread into toast. There's a difference between warm bread and toast. The difference is the chemical change. And so that's similar to the chemical change in toasting a marshmallow. 